Okay, the next item of business is a debate on inquiry into the use of made affirmative procedure uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. I would invite members who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible, or place an R in the chat function if they're joining us online. And I call on Stuart McMillan to speak on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for around seven minutes. Mr McMillan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First of all, I am delighted to open this debate on the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's inquiry into the use of the made affirmative procedure during the coronavirus pandemic. At the outset, I would like to thank all those that appeared before the committee and provided written evidence at very short notice. We only agreed to hold the inquiry in late November, so uh, we are very grateful to hear from so many in such a short space of time. I also want to thank the clerking team and also the legal team who have been invaluable during this inquiry and have ensured that our report was turned around in such a short time frame that we allocated ourselves. Uh, being able to hear from witnesses remotely allowed us to take evidence despite new restrictions due to the Omicron variant. Uh, while I know that meeting in person is always preferable uh, and beneficial, virtual meetings have their place and uh, they can sometimes be challenging, as we know, presiding officer, but they provide Parliament with another option to hear from witnesses, in addition to helping reduce the carbon footprint of Parliament and also individuals. Before I cover the Committee's main findings, I want to uh, first mention why this work was important and should matter to us all here in Parliament, and, and also not just the, to the five members of the Committee. The use of the made affirmative procedure since March 2020, which has allowed the Scottish Government to bring into force a large number of very significant powers immediately, is a classic case of a debate which predates us here in the Scottish Parliament, namely the balance of power between Parliament and also the Government of the day. Dr Ruth Fox, Director of the Hansard Society, reminded the Committee that debates on how statutory instruments are laid and scrutinised were taking place in the 1930s. Books were published in the aftermath of the Second World War about the government by diktat and the use of emergency provisions. Dr Fox told us that concerns about the concentration of legislative power with the executive and the shift of influence away from Parliament has been, and I quote, a long-running sore. So the committee's report should be read in the context of that history. The committee is clear in the report that we do not wish to remove the made affirmative procedure. The committee has regularly acknowledged that the made affirmative instruments have allowed the Scottish Government to respond quickly to the many challenges presented by the coronavirus. However, we do want to ensure that bringing such substantial changes into force immediately, changes that have often impacted on all aspects of our lives before any parliamentary scrutiny should only be used if essential, and such emergency powers should not, as we have often heard from witnesses, become a habit. We want to make sure that the balance of power between the Parliament and the Government is indeed balanced. Each of the Committee's recommendations have sought to do just that. Our first set of recommendations focus on the clarity and accessibility of law. We heard from Sir, from Sir, Jonathan, Davis, sorry, Sir Jonathan Jones QC, the former head of the UK Government's legal department, that within the Westminster context, there were times during the pandemic when extreme urgency was prioritised over the quality and comprehension of legislation. The Law Society of Scotland highlighted concerns about the clarity and accessibility of made affirmative instruments, which are subject to frequent and significant amendment. It suggested that when amending an instrument, the government should produce a consolidated version showing the whole instrument as amended. And the committee agrees. We want to ensure that all legislation is properly and clearly drafted, so that it is legally accurate. It should also be easy to find and also can be interpreted by all, particularly given that many regulations made during the pandemic placed significant restrictions and potential criminal sanctions on individuals and businesses. Our various practical recommendations seek to help this to happen. The report then calls for a number of changes to how made affirmative instruments are brought forward. Currently, the majority of made affirmative instruments are laid under the 2020 Coronavirus Act and the 2008 Public Health Scotland Act. Under both Acts, it is for the Scottish Government to determine whether the regulations need to be made urgently. The University of Birmingham's COVID-19 Review Observatory found that the frequent use of the made affirmative procedure uh, since the start of the pandemic raised questions about how the urgency threshold is operating as a constraint. Others spoke of the potential for the made affirmative to become a habit. The Deputy First Minister told us in committee that the use of the procedure is not the default view of the Scottish Government. He also said that 
he would consider adding a statement of urgency to all made affirmatives. The committee has called on the Scottish Government to do just that. If the committee is not satisfied with the Government's justification, it reserves the right to seek to raise this matter in the Chamber and to do so quickly. The committee has suggested options for how this might work in practice during, uh, sorry, using current procedures. It has also invited the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee to explore further procedural options as part of its inquiry into shaping parliamentary procedures and practices for the future. The committee would be very grateful for the SPPA committee to consider this as part of their work. I will move on proceeding also to how the Parliament looks at the proposals for made affirmative powers in new bills. This is already very prescient. The committee had an initial look at such proposals in the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Bill this morning. And professor Stephen Tierney, the Professor of Constitutional Theory at the University of Edinburgh, told the committee that adequate scrutiny of primary legislation, which creates delegated powers, is a key part of robust lawmaking. The committee agrees. To ensure this robust approach, we have outlined a set of four key principles that we will use to scrutinise any such proposals. And go back to my opening comments, we hope that these will help to ensure that there is an appropriate balance of power between the Parliament and also the Government of the day. Finally, presenting also, let me briefly highlight the expedited affirmative procedure. The affirmative procedure enables the delegated powers and law reform committee and the lead committee to conduct their respective technical and policy scrutiny roles before proposed changes are made into law. And as Morag Ross QC, representing the Faculty of Advocates, noted that individuals that might scrutinise legislation already enforced differently from legislation which is still prospective. The committee would therefore be happy to consider uh, with the Scottish Government uh, the COVID-19 Recovery Committee and the Parliamentary Bureau on a case-by-case -case basis for when the use of an expedited affirmative procedure as an alternative to the use of the made affirmative procedure might be appropriate and the parliamentary timescales for such scrutiny. Also in conclusion, I refer members to sections 106 and 107 of the committee report. And we acknowledge that the Scottish Government did not start out in 2020 with a plan to use the made affirmative 146 times. However, we did embark on this short inquiry because of the importance of proper parliamentary scrutiny that leads to good law which is accessible to all. And with that, I also thank you very much and look forward to hearing the rest of the contributions in the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr McMillan. Uh, I now call on John Swinney for around six minutes, Deputy First Minister. President Officer, the Government welcomes the opportunity to participate in this debate and I have listened with interest to the Convener's explanation of how the Committee conducted its inquiry and to his explanation of the Committee's key recommendations. Um, I responded yesterday in an initial response to the Committee's uh, conclusions as requested uh, by the Committee to give a sense of the Government's response to the issues that have been raised. I will amplify that in my comments today and I hope the committee and its convener found the response yesterday helpful, but we will of course reflect in full on this debate and on the report in due course and submit uh, a substantial response to the committee's inquiry. Um, I think it is important at the outset of this discussion to provide some context from the government's perspective. When I gave evidence to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee on its inquiry last month, I put on record the Government's general position on the use of the made affirmative procedure. I emphasise that the made affirmative procedure is a very unusual power granted by Parliament in those situations usually related to safeguarding public health when action may need to be taken more quickly than the normal affirmative procedure allows for. I assured the Committee that the Government does not take lightly the use of the made affirmative procedure. It is a quite exceptional power, but it has been required in these quite exceptional times. It is clear to me from the vantage point that I have that it has been an essential tool in enabling the Government to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. The Government has a duty to protect public health, and it is important that we continue to have the option of using the made affirmative procedure when urgent action is required to protect public health. However, I do recognise the challenges which the use of the made affirmative procedure gives in terms of parliamentary scrutiny and the challenges that that throws up for committees and for Parliament. And I recognise why the committee wished to conduct an inquiry into how that power has been exercised and any lessons that can be learned from that experience. Let me now turn, presiding officer, to the committee's report and its recommendations. 
I think it would be fair to say that none of us could have envisaged at the beginning of the pandemic just how long the public health crisis would be with us. And I think it would be fair to say that none of us could have envisaged how regularly we would need to make regulatory changes to deal with the pandemic. I therefore think it is helpful that the committee's report recognises at paragraph 108 that the made affirmative procedure has been, and I quote, a vital tool in the handling of the pandemic. The committee rightly emphasises the importance of ensuring that regulations brought forward under the made affirmative procedure are robust, are clear in their meaning and are accessible to those they apply to. I share that view and the Government aspires to those characteristics in all of the legislation that it brings forward. The Committee also rightly emphasises that the Government should make clear why it considers urgent action to be necessary when the use of the made affirmative procedure is proposed. I recognise the Committee expects that justification to be made on a case-by-case -case basis, and the Government accepts that point. However, I think it is worth making a general point here, as I did when I gave evidence to the Committee, about why it is necessary to have the made affirmative procedure at all. That general point is the timing constraints which apply under the normal affirmative procedure. Standing orders allow for 40 days of Committee scrutiny before a Chamber vote is taken on whether the regulation should pass. The reason for the existence of the made affirmative procedure is to enable regulatory action to be taken much more quickly to safeguard public health. And as we have seen from our experience in the course of the pandemic, a period of 40 days is an extraordinarily long period of time in the handling of the challenges of the pandemic that we have faced. Indeed, I'm, uh, uh, if, uh, if Mr Simpson allows me to provide an example, I will then give way. The Government at the end of October, of November last year, uh, had a Cabinet meeting on a Tuesday at which we considered the pandemic to be in a relatively stable position. 48 hours later, my colleague Mr Matheson was on calls with the United Kingdom Government about the disclosure of the information around Omicron and the, and the advancing pace of circulation of that virus. So 48 hours changed fundamentally our view of what type of conditions, the type of conditions with which we were wrestling. So I make that point to register the need for swift action where that is necessary to do so. I'll give away to Mr Simpson. Graham Simpson. Can I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for giving way, taking the intervention. Um, would, would he uh, accept, and this was a recommendation made in the report, that it is possible to have an expedited procedure so Parliament can act at pace, so it doesn't need to take 40 days if we have an affirmative procedure. We could change things if we need to act quickly. Deputy First Minister, I'll give you the time back. Uh, th thank you, President. Officer. I, I think that, that's a, a, an eminently a deliverable proposition, but it depends on how long we're talking about. And I don't want that in any way to sound like the length of a piece of string, but it is relevant because we, I, I cited the example there and if we go back to the events of March 2020, um, in, in that period in March 2020, events moved at an absolutely ferocious pace. And we had to take decisions of a dramatic nature in a very short space in time. And indeed, some decisions we took, which we thought were dramatic, had to be taken even quicker of even more dramatic nature very shortly thereafter. So I think there is a possibility of doing what Mr Simpson talks about. And that may be it may be in the light of the pandemic valuable for the government and the committee to consider in perhaps a slightly more uh, relaxed context what that might look like so that we all are aware of what an, a, a super expedited procedure might look like uh, if, if we want to give it some terminology. So the, the government um, uh, is very happy in relation to the points raised by the committee to explain on a case-by-case -case basis what is driving urgent action. But the fundamental issue which the government has got to determine is whether the action needs to be taken more quickly than is provided for under the normal affirmative procedure. And that may open up some of the space that I've just discussed with Mr Simpson for further dialogue. 
The committee also rightly emphasises that the use of the made affirmative procedure should not become the new normal. I want to confirm with Parliament what I said to the committee. That is also the government's view. I am happy to confirm that the government has no intention of made affirmative powers routinely being included in government bills. However, such powers have a place and the committee will know, for example, that made affirmative powers have been included in the COVID recovery and reform bill because in that context, that bill is envisaged to create a set of powers that may have to be used because of the urgency and gravity of the situation that we face. Uh, I'm happy to give way. Uh, Martin Wakefield, very briefly, please. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And would the Deputy um, First Minister also agree that if those bills that um, uh, embed this procedure, they should be properly scrutinised by this Parliament before they go forward? Deputy First Minister, I'd be grateful uh, if you could um, I, I, keep I winding up. Uh, unreservedly, uh, and, that's, and that is what the government is providing for in the parliamentary timescale that is available. And of course, the, the usual scrutiny of stages one, two, and three will be available for the COVID recovery and reform bill. And I look forward to engaging with Parliament on that question. Indeed, Mr. Whitfield may be an active player in that, that bill. Um, so I fully accept that the government will need to justify why such powers are appropriate for inclusion in that bill. And I note the set of principles which the committee has in, identified to support its scrutiny. Um, in summary, Presiding Officer, um, I would emphasise the Government accepts that the made affirmative power is an exceptional power. I welcome the helpful analysis from the Committee of the use of the power over the last two years and will reflect further on its recommendations. And, uh, I think it is important that Parliament considers the impact of the pandemic on its legislative basis, which is why we have brought forward other legislation which will, as I confirmed to Mr Whitfield, be subject to further scrutiny within Parliament. Thank you very much indeed. And I call on Graham Simpson uh, for around five minutes, please, Mr Simpson. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm in my second spell on the DPLR committee. My first was as convener, and you might be forgiven for thinking that I earned a second stint because my chief whip doesn't like me, which may well be true. <laughs> However, I actually made the schoolboy error of telling him how important the committee is. It's the gatekeeper. We see everything. We see the tricks the government is up to, though a committee report would never use such a phrase. But that's what this inquiry was about. In layman's terms, this inquiry was about the way in which this government has been making law without Parliament scrutinising it and voting on it first. Yes? Deputy First Minister. Does Mr Simpson... Uh, agree with me that the language he uses belittles the challenges of the pandemic? Graham Simpson. Uh, no, not at all. It's the way I see it. The figures bear it out. Between 2012 and 2019, the made affirmative procedure had only been used nine times, but between March 2020 and February 1 this year, it was used 146 times. So when I described it as becoming the norm, and John Swinney described that as ludicrous, I was right and he was wrong. It's become ridiculous at times. Quite often, Parliament has been voting on things that are no longer there. Now you see it, now you don't. It's like the Derren Brown School of Legislating. The ridiculous Manchester travel ban is a good example. Nicola Sturgeon had come to her senses before MSPs could tell her to wise up. Had it come to us in advance, we could have spared the First Minister a needless spat with Andy Burnham. Now, can I thank the committee clerks and all our witnesses and the convener for helping us to produce an excellent report? So Jonathan Jones QC told us that using the no scrutiny route had become a habit here and at Westminster, and it was a bad one, and I agree. Dr Ruth Fox of the Hansard Society reminded us that the tension between governments wanting to push the boundaries and Parliament wanting to keep them in check was as old as the hills. Professor Stephen Tierney agreed with me that if you give governments an inch, they'll take a mile, which is what has happened. And Morag Ross QC was of the view that rapidly changing legislation can become confusing, and this led to our recommendation that legislation should be consolidated so it can be easily read. In order to use the no scrutiny route, 
All the minister has to do is decide that something is urgent. He or she doesn't have to say why. They don't have to justify it. And the University of Birmingham COVID-19 Review Observatory said the urgency requirement is not an effective constraint on the use of the made affirmative procedure. It said the use of that procedure should be justified to ensure that all SSIs are treated as exceptional, and the committee agreed with that. Now, the committee was very clear on this. If you think something is so urgent that you feel you have to legislate without the normal checks and balances, then you need to say why. And if the committee disagrees, then the matter should be brought to the chamber. And if it can be debated, then it should be open to all members to contribute. This government has been ramming through legislation at will without scrutiny on a weekly, sometimes daily basis, and that has to stop. We're long past the stage where governments need to legislate at the kind of pace that might be justified in wartime. And I would argue that actually we could have scrutinised every piece of legislation prior to it coming into force, and we certainly should be doing that from here on in. The committee makes just that point. Both the DPLR, well, I think I'm in my last minute, but I'll take an intervention if I'm given time. Yep, you can get the time back. John yes. Mason. Would you accept, thank you for giving way, that, that there are at least some cases like the, the travel restrictions to foreign countries, which were both at a UK and a Scottish level, which in fact even two days was probably too long. They should have been immediate. Graham Simpson. Well, I am making the point, uh, Mr Mason, that I believe this Parliament is up to the job of scrutinising any piece of legislation, and we can do so at pace. And given that we have a hybrid form of working now, people can do that from home. I'd be prepared to work weekends if it was necessary. Now, both the DPLR... Very briefly, if yeah, I can give you the time back. Stuart McMillan. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm now going to ask the question, not as convener, but obviously as an SNP member. Uh, but uh, Graham Simpson acknowledged that uh, at the outset of the pandemic. There were challenges in terms of the hybrid working. There were challenges with the Parliament in terms of the hybrid working. So, uh, as when the Deputy First Minister was speaking earlier on regarding uh, some of the, the early uh, instruments that had to go through the Parliament, then the, his comments regarding uh, the hybrid working might not actually have been uh, acceptable and suitable at that particular time. Graham Simpson. I think Stuart McMillan uh, has, has a point because hybrid working wasn't there initially, so we may have struggled, but now it is. Um, so I think, um, I think Stuart McMillan actually agrees with this point. Um, he might not be able to say it, but I think he does, that we could act at pace. Now, both the DPLR committee and the COVID committee have unanimously said the affirmative procedure should be the default. So I do hope the COVID committee will reject anything done otherwise forthwith, unless it is to get rid of restrictions. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'll close, too many committee reports are ignored by government. This report is for government, but it's also for Parliament, and I hope you and your colleagues will take a stand too, uh, because you're there to defend Parliament, and we've been bypassed for the past two years, and it has to stop. Thank you, Mr Simpson. And I call on Neil Bibby, um, who joins us remotely, for around four minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, President Officer, and I commend the committee for their thorough and insightful report. President Officer, it is of course right that government should be able to act swiftly and decisively when faced with unprecedented challenges. There is always a tension when legislating between urgency and scrutiny, but democratic accountability is vital and it is what Parliament is for. Through the burden of proof for a proposed sacrificing of democratic accountability, even in the name of urgency, must be very high. This is the basic principle from which I and Scottish Labour approach this matter. The Scottish Government went from using the made affirmative procedure on average once or twice per year prior to the pandemic to using it over 140 times since the pandemic began. This is understandable. The COVID emergency obviously necessitated urgent action that made the use of made affirmative powers entirely appropriate. Nevertheless, as the committee has also acknowledged, proper parliamentary scrutiny is vital and we must ensure these powers do not in any way become normalised. Scrutiny and debate make for better legislation. 
Unrestrained and unaccountable ministerial powers do not. We therefore endorse entirely the committee's findings that there would be significant dangers in government using procedures like this if the public was not aware of what was being done and why, and if Parliament not and if Parliament not fully informed and able to hold the government to account. There are also important concerns around the need to have high standards of drafting. High quality drafting takes time and effort. Presiding officer and legislation made in a hurry is unlikely to be of the same quality as legislation where due care and attention has been paid. Rectifying errors in drafting can also be complex and time consuming. I therefore echo the committee's call for the Scottish Government to outline its internal checks and balances when making changes to the law. This is entirely reasonable. Parliament and the people deserve to know what has been done in order to avoid errors in legislation. In line with all of these concerns, the committee makes important recommendations regarding a test of urgency. Given the significant use of made affirmative instruments, it is wholly reasonable to ask for guarantees that they only be used in exceptional circumstances. We therefore support the committee in its call, calls for the Scottish Government to publish criteria on whether a situation uh, is suitably urgent to provide a written statement prior to the instrument coming into force and to ensure that such regulations are published as quickly as possible so that those impacted fully understand the changes made. The committee also raises a further important point regarding the parliamentary process. The report points out that there is at present no obvious mechanism by which ministers could debate a made affirmative issue with sufficient speed. Perhaps then the challenges of the pandemic have identified some weaknesses with scrutiny in this place that need to be addressed more generally. Perhaps it is time to consider recommendations to strengthen the role of Parliament, including perhaps use of an expedited affirmative procedure as an alternative to the use of made affirmative procedure. This is a proposal raised in the committee report and it is worth looking at seriously. Presiding officer, the committee sets out four principles. First, the use of the affirmative procedure should be the default position in all but exceptional and urgent circumstances. Second, when use of made affirmative powers is proposed, Parliament requires an assurance that the situation is urgent and with an opportunity for a debate in a timely manner. Thirdly, ministers should include an assessment of impact on those affected by any instrument in the explanation they provide. And fourth, legislation containing provision for made affirmative provision must contain sunset clauses. These four principles are strong ones and should be supported. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Bibby. We now move to the open debate and I call firstly Jenny Minto, who will be followed by Murdo Fraser um, for around four minutes, please, Ms Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I attended the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee as a substitute for its meeting on the 11th of January 2022. So, unlike Mr Simpson, I was not steeped in um, the, the history of, of that committee. Um, this was the final evidence session of the Committee's inquiry into the use of the made affirmative procedure during the coronavirus pandemic. And evidence was being taken from the Deputy First Minister, as he has stated. So I, no pressure that day at all. Um, reading the evidence already provided by the two earlier sessions, there was much agreement um, from all of the witnesses on the key areas of questioning, clarity and accessibility of law, how to define urgency and scrutiny of the executive by parliament. I'll look at each of these separately, but briefly. I have the ability to do so from two different points of view. Firstly, as a parliamentarian, and secondly, in my previous life as a community activist, when we were looking for up-to-date and clear guidance set out in a way that was easy to understand and to pass on to those who we were supporting during the COVID pandemic. The law should be clear and accessible to all, especially where the law is continually changing and sometimes coming into force with immediate effect, as, been, as has been the case during this pandemic. And Sir Jonathan Jones said, ironically, it's probably true to say that it is easier to legislate for a lockdown with very tight controls and only minimal exceptions by drafting very tight and clear laws than it is to legislate, as we saw later in the pandemic, for partial closures and multiple exceptions. Now, from my own experience during lockdown and the emergence of it, I recognise this analysis. Throughout the pandemic, individuals, businesses and communities were looking for clear guidance and timely guidance as to what they should or should not be doing. Emerging from the lockdown was difficult. 
The resilience group I was part of discussed this long and hard as to how we achieved it safely on Isla. The Scottish Government's route map provided the blueprint for our work. To ensure that the laws are clearly understandable to everyone affected, the DPLR committee has concluded that policy notes and explanatory notes be written in plain English and in sufficient detail. Defining urgency was seen as, a key, it was seen as key in determining the use of the made affirmative procedure. In her evidence, Morag Gross QC suggested that it would be tempting to think that we could narrow that down to say that urgency definitely means X or Y and that it does not mean Z, A, B or C. She went on to say, also things change, so there must be flexibility to allow decisions to be made that respond to changing circumstances. Urgency might mean one thing in one week and something else in week two, so you have to allow for responses to be developed. Now, um, the example that the Deputy First Minister has just given in his speech actually talked about 48 hours. And he concluded in his evidence by saying, in my book, that is why urgent action is required, because the situation has changed before our eyes in a very dramatic order and fashion. In its conclusions, as others have said, the committee has asked for transparency as to be the correct... Uh, sorry has asked for transparency as to the criteria for determining in a situation is suitably urgent to merit the use of a made affirmative procedure by requesting a written statement of justification and evidence prior to the instrument coming into force and to ensure that any such regulations are published as quickly as possible. All witnesses raised concerns about the increased use of the made affirmative procedure during the coronavirus pandemic and how this has impacted on Parliament's scrutinising or holding the executive to account. Professor Tierney commented, From my work in scrutinising legislation over many years, I have come to realise that all governments like powers. They like to get more of them. In answering my question uh, on what the Scottish Government has learned from the pandemic and how this could sh it shape and how it could shape future decision making and the use of made affirmative procedures to allow proper parliamentary scrutiny, the Deputy First Minister said, in the circumstances of a global pandemic, that requires swift action. The measures that have been taken are appropriate. However, we should always be open to learning lessons from the situation, and the government will consider with care any output from the committee's inquiry. Presiding officer, the DPLR report and its conclusions provide a number of suggestions as to how the decisions around the made affirmative procedure could be enhanced. I hope the Scottish government does consider its findings with care. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I now call on Murdo Fraser to be followed by Martin Whitfield for around four minutes, Mr. Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I welcome this opportunity to make a short contribution to this debate on the MATE affirmative procedure and its use during the coronavirus pandemic? And I would commend the members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for taking the time to look into this topic. I'd also remind members of my register of interests in that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. This debate may seem to be about a dry and arcane issue of parliamentary procedure, but in fact raises some really quite serious issues around our democracy and proper parliamentary scrutiny of government actions. It is important we put all this in context. We have seen an unprecedented public health emergency, which has required governments across the world to act quickly in the public interest, restricting individual liberties and bringing in restrictions which in normal times will be deemed to be totally unacceptable. Because of the speed of changes throughout the pandemic, government sometimes had to act very quickly without going through the normal parliamentary processes and opportunities for scrutiny. And all that is understood. But there is an important point being made by the committee in their report, in that the made affirmative procedure, in other words, regulations coming into force instantly on their being laid, with any scrutiny in parliament taking place retrospectively, perhaps weeks after the event, can lead to poor quality of legislation and bad law. Giving evidence to the Committee on behalf of the Faculty of Advocates, Morag Ross QC warned that, in general, legislation that is made in a hurry is unlikely to be of the same quality as legislation to which great thought has been given and for which preparation has been undertaken. A very good example of this situation arises in the case of vaccine passports. Vaccine passports remain a very controversial part of the COVID legislation, and we have argued previously that there is little or no evidence of their effectiveness. Indeed, in the evidence paper the Scottish Government themselves published in November 
last year, they effectively conceded that vaccine passports had very little value in preventing the spread of COVID or in increasing the uptake uh, rate for vaccination. And indeed, the First Minister confirmed just uh, an hour or so ago that uh, vaccine passports would be removed in a few weeks' time. Now, the Scottish Government used the made affirmative procedure to introduce the regulations for vaccine passports, although there was time for a more considered approach. A month passed between the date when the Scottish Government announced that vaccine passports would be introduced and the original implementation date for the policy. Indeed, there was then a two-week grace period when the Government accepted that these regulations, although implemented, would not actually be enforced on businesses. There would therefore have been time for proper parliamentary scrutiny of what was being proposed, rather than it being done retrospectively, as was the case. And indeed, the only reason we had parliamentary scrutiny, if I remember, was that uh, the Conservatives allowed opposition debating time to be used to shine a light on these proposals. There are two other points I'll make briefly, uh, which have been highlighted by the committee. One is about the clarity and accessibility of instruments, which have been amended many times. And this was raised by the Law Society of Scotland in their evidence. And they cited the example of the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Scotland Regulations 2020, which were amended no less than 25 times. And this uh, undoubtedly causes a great deal of confusion for those trying to consolidate the rules. And the committee called for consideration uh, to improve accessibility uh, of consolidation of such instruments. The committee uh, also called for criteria to be published by the Scottish Government for the circumstances in which it would use made affirmative procedure in the future. I think that's a very helpful recommendation, and one which I hope the Government will listen to. Presiding officer, to conclude, I would accept there is a case for the use of the made affirmative procedure in emergency circumstances, but the concern I would have, reflecting that of the committee, is that use of this procedure, bypassing proper parliamentary scrutiny, has become too frequent. As we, move, as we move out from this phase of the COVID pandemic and relax restrictions rather than impose them, I hope that lessons will be learned by the Scottish Government for any future situation which arises. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed, uh, Mr Fraser. I, I'm afraid we've now exhausted all the time we had in available, so I would be grateful if colleagues would stick to their time limits. Uh, and with that, over to you, Martin Whitfield, who will be followed by John Mason for around four minutes, Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I uh, hear your cry to stick within time, and I will do that for you. Um, can I welcome this report and thank the committee and the convener for their excellent work in taking the evidence? And I would like just to echo Stuart Macmillan's uh, comments about the use of the hybrid proceedings to allow those people to contribute. And indeed, interestingly, in comments that have been made so far, the hybrid proceeding has been noted as one of the reasons why perhaps better parliamentary scrutiny could indeed take place. And this is something that I know this chamber and those outside will look forward to as we move on. And the conclusions of the report I very much welcome. But I would like to stand here to um, address the chamber, partly as convener of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, and to thank Stuart for his letter, which has been received. Um, and appears on our work schedule in due course, and we will take a look at it. Because it is concerning that one aspect um, highlighted in the report shows one of the um, absences within the standing orders and the parliamentary procedures that we have here within this building, and that is the inability to um, hold to account the government. And if a chamber is of any use, its role must be to hold government to account. And we have heard, and I very much welcome John Swinney's comments, that this is an exceptional power used in exceptional situations. But I have found, and I think is evidenced from other legislatures, that sometimes the habit of easy power comes very easily and is repeated. So again, I just um, reconfirm that I, I'm grateful for the, the Deputy First Minister's comments about it. And I hope all those that hold his post and other government posts going forward will also remember that this is an exceptional power and in an exceptional situation. But also because of that, it is right that this chamber should hold to account those decisions. And provisions should be able to be made so that this chamber can take account and hold, question, and hopefully, and I say this carefully, improve legislation – 
which, as Mirror Fraser so rightly points out, if is um, put through too fast, often lacks in clarity, understanding, and that's reflected in those that read this legislation outside of this place of what their understanding should be. So the committee that I have the pleasure to convene has been invited to consider this matter. And although, of course, I can't speak on behalf of the committee, I can undertake both to this chamber and to the committee that's produced this report that we will discuss it and liaise with the um, convener to seek any additional information that may be available. Because there must be, there must be a way of holding to account government decisions which don't leave just the convener of a committee in this place to hold to account, or indeed the use of an urgent question, or indeed supplementary questions. So in order to allow this debate to get on time, can I undertake to do what I have said to do? Can I welcome this report? But I can, can I also welcome the government's assurances that this will remain an exceptional power used in exceptional circumstances? Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Impeccable timing. And I call on uh, John Mason, who we'll will be followed by the closing speakers again. Four minutes, Mr. Mason. Thank you very much. I can always use Martin Whitfield's extra time, perhaps. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to take part in today's debate. Uh, I have to say I'm not currently a member of the DPLR committee, although I have been, uh, and I have huge respect for those members who find its normal work interesting. <laughs> however, however, I was keen to take part in this debate today, especially as I'm a member of the COVID committee, and it is largely because of COVID that more use has been made of the made affirmative procedure. I think virtually all of us accept that many decisions had to be made quickly during the pandemic and there was not time for the usual, often lengthy consultation and scrutiny process to take place. We are all loyal to our parties and generally vote along party lines. However, we also have responsibilities as parliamentarians to ensure that Parliament works well, as I am convinced that when Parliament works well, Scotland as a whole benefits. And I have to say I am disappointed eh, by some of Graham Simpson's eh, comments, which I think got the balance wrong between taking a party line and being a parliamentarian. Therefore, I did welcome the fact that the DPLR committee was carrying out this inquiry and I commend it on its report. Now, I do also accept that we're needing to strike a balance here between acting quickly and potentially giving a longer notice period to those affected by particular regulations on the one hand and acting more slowly to allow Parliament more time for scrutiny, even though that meant less time for those affected to know where they stood on the other hand. An example of this, as Murdo Fraser said, was the vaccine certificates or passports, and this is referred to in paragraph 37 of the report. More time was given than with other decisions between this policy being announced and it's actually coming into effect. And that meant COVID committee had more time to take evidence from witnesses and potentially there was time for the affirmative procedure to be used. But on the other hand, the nightclubs and others were demanding certainty as far ahead as possible so that they could prepare, and their preference was for a decision to be made as quickly as possible, albeit only after their voice had been heard. I particularly like the statement in the report recommendations 10.1 that use of the affirmative procedure should be the default position in all but exceptional and urgent circumstances. Legislation making provision for the made affirmative procedure must be very closely framed and its exercise tightly limited. Also, recommendation 11, that an expedited affirmative procedure might be preferable to made affirmative on a case-by-case -case basis and with agreement of the government, the Bureau, the lead committee and DPLR. That would certainly be my personal preference, if at all possible, and there was support for this within the COVID committee, as evidenced by our letter to the DPLR committee, which is referenced in paragraph 93. I might take a slight issue with recommendation 13, although it may just be the way it is worded. I agree that considering legislation before it comes into effect should not come at any cost. However, I do not think that it should become habitual, i.e. if that means considering it before it comes into effect. I note the point that John Swinney makes, which is quoted in paragraph 46, that we have had almost weekly statements for the last two years and have had ample opportunity to ask questions of the government and also to have relevant witnesses at committee. I suspect few other countries have had such opportunities. However, there's a slightly separate point from scrutinising the actual legislation for which the timescales have been much more compressed. Morag Ross QC makes the very valid point that we all inevitably look at legislation differently depending on whether it is already in force 
and effectively a fait accompli, compared to how we would consider an instrument which will come into force in 28 days' time. So overall, I commend the DPLR Committee for its inquiry and report. I think it was very important that we as a parliament considered this issue, and I hope it will be a learning experience for all of us going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Mason. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Paul Sweeney for around four minutes. Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It was a pleasure to take part in this inquiry um, into the use of this procedure, which is very unusual in the history of devolution and indeed across our legislative framework in the UK. Um, and I think we all agree that there were exceptional circumstances. But now that we have an opportunity, perhaps, in the coming months to reflect on how this was used, this particular report will hopefully help guide Parliament in deliberating on how we can improve our processes, how we can improve the scrutiny of quality legislation. And I'd like to thank the convener for his chairing of the, the committee and effectively. I'd like to also thank the, the, the convener of the Public Standards Committee, Procedures and Standards uh, Committee for coming forward as well, because I think there is a symbiotic relationship in what we are doing to try and improve Parliament and ensure that the quality of our legislation is safeguarded. There will inevitably be a tension between the executive and the legislature, and that bo was borne out by the witnesses who came forward. I noted Dr Fox in particular, as mentioned by the convener's uh, historical perspective on things, where there's been a decades-long debate about the nature of the tension between the executive and legislature. And I think this particular situation offers us some insight to how it tends to be a ratcheting process. So whilst it might be virtuous of government ministers to say they will happily surrender powers as soon as they are not necessary, the general trend of behaviour has been a ratcheting or one-way effect where power is hoarded by the executive and it has to be an active push or pullback from the legislature in order to recover that power and offer scrutiny to government. And I think that's what we are proposing in a decent balance. The made affirmative procedure might be unusual um, but this offers us an opportunity to build a new type of legislative framework, and that is what has been suggested by some of the witnesses to the, the inquiry. Um, I mean, this goes back to Lord Hailsham's description of the House of Commons often being an elective dictatorship, and that was in 1976. And of course, the nature of the electoral system in the House of Commons means that it generally does produce executive control of the chamber. It's something that's less likely in Holyrood because of the electoral system. So actually in Holyrood, there's a greater scope and a greater opportunity for us to apply a balance of power um, that provides an effective check on exe the executive's execution of it. And that's also borne out in the committee because of course it is actually opposition members who hold the balance of power. So that offers a, that offers a degree of a check, an effective check on, on executive control. Uh, and I think that's a welcome thing. Um, I noted particularly uh, Sir Jonathan Jones's contribution, where he mentioned that we should go further and have a new Statutory Instruments Act. Uh, he mentioned that there was a very outdated Statutory Instruments Act of 1946, which probably is getting past its sell-by date. Perhaps this is a watershed moment for the government to reflect more fundamentally on the, the, the suitability of existing procedures, fundamentally, to deal with the modern threats we face, the modern challenges we face as a legislature. And I would also say the innovations, as mentioned by the convener, um, of the public procedures and standards committee, sorry, uh, on the opportunity for the hybrid uh, chamber to use this as a, in a better way. We know, for example, there are huge opportunities for us to work in real time. Why can't we have live committees working in real time, committees of the whole house if necessary, committees of the whole chamber if necessary, to work with the government to craft those bills, those craft those fast track legislative processes? Happy to give way. Deputy First Minister. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Sweeney for giving way. Um, he, he said the, the, the government had to consider some of these issues. I, I think there's also a scope for Parliament, a necessity for Parliament to consider these issues, because I'm sure he would accept from me that waiting 40 days for a, an urgent provision to be enacted is, in a public health emergency, just far too long for us to wait. But there are quicker ways of doing it with good scrutiny, which the government is perfectly happy to consider. Paul Sweeney. I welcome the Deputy First Minister's comments on that, and I think that is really important, particularly reflecting on Professor Tierney's point about there need to be a legislative code that underpins all this, because we can't simply rely on the goodwill of ministers and parliamentarians to make this work. This sort of good chaps theory of government has very much been put to the test uh, in, in recent years, and I think we need to look at a better way of codifying it all. 
and I welcome the, the Deputy First Minister's comments in that regard. So, in that spirit, let us work together to enact some of the recommendations, the, the commitments of this report, and build a better legislative framework, because we can build a new system of statutory instruments that better reflect the pace and change needed in our democracy today. Thank you. I now call on Craig Hoy. Around four minutes, please, Mr Hoy. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to open by thanking my colleagues on the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for the report that we are debating today. And I would like, also like to thank the clerks and the wider committee team for their support. Despite the nature of this issue, issue today's debate has been neither technical nor uh, dry. And that is because it goes to the heart of parliamentary democracy, as Paul Sweeney has just said. Today's debate answers why it is important that MSPs acting independently and collectively as a legislative body have the proper powers and processes in place to scrutinise laws and regulations, and through that to hold the government to account. Deputy Presiding Officer, in the face of unprecedented public health emergency, we handed powers to ministers to an extent that we would never have considered acceptable before. We handed them these powers on an emergency basis, and we handed them these, these powers to ministers on a temporary basis. We accepted the need for legislation to be brought in at speed, sometimes with little or no parliamentary scrutiny at all. And we also accepted that hastily written regulations, which might prove through time to be far from perfect, were at times likely to be better than no regulations at all. However, as the public health emergency recedes, it is time to ask ministers to hand these powers back to Parliament and ultimately uh, to the people. But ministers now want to enshrine many of these powers, uh, from shutting schools to closing pubs, into law on a permanent basis. And that leads me to conclude that ministers are punched drunk on powers that do not ultimately belong to them. Having got the taste of these powers, they want to keep them now and into the future. And that's why, as Neil Bibby said, uh, the four principles set out in this report are fundamental to this uh, parliament and its secure workings in the future. So, at this point in time, I think it is safe to conclude that the use of the made affirmative procedure is now a habit and a bad habit. So is the shift towards using skeleton legislation to give the government greater powers through delegated regulatory processes, even if this is, as is identified in the report, a long running sore. But as my uh, committee colleague, Graham Simpson, noted, between 2012 and 2019, the made affirmative procedure had only been used nine times in this parliament. But between March 2020 and February the 1st of this year, it was used 146 times. So when it comes to whether or not I agree with Mr. Simpson or Mr. Swinney as to whether this is now the norm, laying party loyalties to one side, I found myself on balance siding with Mr. Simpson. Presiding officer, this approach has become the norm and this parliament should rightly be concerned about this. Had this parliament given the opportunity, had, sorry, had this parliament been given the opportunity to fully scrutinise the Manchester travel ban or COVID passports, ministers would have been caught out. They would have been caught out passing laws which were disproportionate or ineffective, or in the case of vaccine certification, both disproportionate and ineffective, something that I suspect deep down the Deputy First Minister knows himself. I will give way. John Mason. Would the member at least accept that with the vaccine certificates, the, the COVID committee spent a considerable amount of time on it and looked at it quite thoroughly? Great Coy. Yes, only, we after, uh, only after we rejected the use of the made affirmative uh, principle in order to be able to get some more scrutiny off it. I seem to recall asking uh, some questions um, of the uh, business minister and being told that in asking questions I was, quote, a rascal. That's their commitment to uh, parliamentary uh, scrutiny. During the course of our inquiry, we heard witnesses uh, raise real concerns about the increased use of the made affirmative procedure. Murdo Fraser quite rightly reflected today on the evidence from Morag Ross QC, who warned that legislation made in a hurry is unlikely to be of the same quality as legislation which is ca carefully drafted over time. Presiding officer, this report could have gone much further, but it is solid and so are its recommendations. And this debate has shown that the government cannot simply brush it aside. Members of this parliament are being sidelined, parliament is being bypassed, and proper parliamentary scrutiny is being undermined. And that is why I hope that MSPs, including those on the government benches, will stand up to ministers on this important issue, and that in turn, ministers will accept the recommendations of this report. Thank you, Mr Hoyt.
And I now call on George Adam, Minister, to uh, respond to the debate on behalf of the Scottish Government. Around four minutes, please. Thank you uh, very much, President Officer, and thank you for everyone that's taking part in this debate. You know, I too, Graham Simpson mentioned that he had uh, been in the, the committee for some time for the DPLR committee. I too did some time in the DPLR committee during my period. You know, and uh, it is an important part uh, of this process and the parliamentary process, and one that I appreciate as the Minister as well. And I appreciate the work that most of uh, our colleagues have done on that committee. Uh, I don't think uh, Mr uh, Simpson's Chief Whip doesn't love him. I don't think uh, he's done that in any shape or form. I think he's, it's just your expertise, Mr Simpson's expertise, uh, presiding officer, on the issue. Although I did not agree with a lot of what he said, however, uh, but uh, maybe he'll get there eventually. Uh, but uh, it was interesting to hear some of the members uh, uh, in this debate today. Paul Sweeney set out a case of us working together and finding solutions uh, in many of these issues. And that's something I personally welcome, and it's maybe a debate that we have ongoing as time proceeds with Mr uh, Sweeney, because I think it gives us an opportunity to actually see let's, how, how can we actually learn the lessons that we have over the past two years. Because uh, John Mason has always uh, framed his debate and went through thoroughly through the committee report and added something a wee bit different, presiding officer. He added some humour into the whole debate as well. And I have to say it's something I look forward to hearing more of from uh, Mr Mason in the future. But the whole part of this debate is we have to frame it on the fact of the two years that we've all lived through. And many of the members, Murder Fraser did mention, Murder Fraser did mention it uh, uh, during his part on the public health crisis that we've all had to deal with. The government has had to balance with the public health crisis and dealing with the public issue and at the same time deal with parliamentary process. And I think it's been a difficult decision and not one that the Deputy First Minister has said on numerous occasions that they have taken lightly. And the idea that the, we have continually as a government gone power mad and uh, just want to retain this is just comical and it's not really worth discussing any further. Uh, Craig Hoy to say there's a, a general shift towards framework bills. This is completely inaccurate. Uh, and with the actual act, when I listened to what the convener said, Stuart, McMillan, uh, Stuart McMillan said, and I followed a lot of what was actually said during the committee uh, uh, the debates as well, during the committee's process. And when he said that Dr Ruth Fox gave evidence in saying there was a problem about uh, retaining power, governments retaining power, and much of how I read that was she was talking from a UK government perspective and the lack of scrutiny that is in the UK government itself, not at the Scottish government dealing with the public health crisis that we had in front of us at that moment. Uh, but on the whole, presiding officer, the government welcomes the spirit of the committee's report and will consider carefully all the recommendations it makes. We have already acknowledged the importance of ensuring the regulations brought forward under the made affirmative procedure are robust, clear in their meaning and are accessible to those they, they, they apply to. Those principles that the government always aspires to and with regard to all legislation it brings forward and is open to challenge where Parliament sees fit to do so. The government is also happy to engage with the committee with any issues around the justification of use of the made affirmative procedure, but under existing legislative frameworks or in the event of seeking parliamentary approval of any fresh use of the tool. From a government perspective, uh, the made affirmative procedure is an exceptional power granted to ministers by parliament to be used in ex exceptional circumstances. The fundamental basis for the procedure is to allow to be taken more quickly than the normal affirmative procedure. And we all know that the idea of the made affirmative procedure has, uh, leads to less scrutiny is not the case because there has been scrutiny at all times. However, the committee's conclusion about the made affirmative procedure should not be every normal practice. It is an important one and it is one that we all agree with. It is one that the Deputy First Minister has said earlier on and it is one that I agree with as well. This is not the way forward for us all. So, in closing, presiding officer, I would just like to say we have had to deal with a public health issue over the past couple of years that has been unprecedented, a word that has been used often. And it has been a situation where we have had to balance between that and dealing with the parliamentary process. Lessons have been learned, and as we move on, I look forward to working with colleagues to finding maybe new ways of being able to work in this place. Thank you, Minister. And I now call on Bill Kidd to wind up the debate on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, up to five minutes, please, Mr Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Now, I 
taken a few notes here, um, and to be quite honest, um, there's been a lot of juking about, if I can put it that way, in terms of uh, a lot of the conversation uh, that's taken place so far has been fairly repetitive amongst people, although everyone has their own opinions. So I try not to miss anybody out, but to be quite honest, if I get it wrong, you can sue me. Um, I'm delighted to close this debate on the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's inquiry into the use of the made affirmative procedure during the coronavirus pandemic, and I'm grateful for the contributions from all members today and also from the Government. Um, there have been a range of comments on the Committee's work, as I say, so I'll try and capture some of these against the four sets of recommendations, which is where the difficulty comes in, because I don't think many people really actually address the four recommendations. Um, on the need for clear and accessible law, as has been said, the Committee wants to ensure that all legislation is properly and clearly drafted, and it should be easy to find and be interpreted by all. Uh, the Deputy First Minister um, did state that 40 days is too long uh, to wait uh, for the enactment of such, um, such legislation during the pandemic, and the made affirmative power was necessary during the public health concerns uh, to require, where it required urgent action. Nonetheless, it requires oversight, he says, by the Parliament, and that is something which others also agreed on. Neil Bibby uh, said that there was exceptional circumstances, and um, it only outlined uh, by the Scottish Government and the need to scrutinise in order to ensure fair and proper legislation is delivered. Jenny Minto said that it must be clear and accessible law at all times for the benefit of broader society, and everyone must be able to understand what is coming forward. Uh, Craig Hoy. Uh, said the debate showed how we accepted in committee the necessity of speed in legislating during COVID, but that the powers enacted must be repealed at this stage and going forward. Uh, the minister, um, there towards the end, uh, said that he didn't believe that the made affirmative power was overused during COVID, as it had been necessary, and consideration of how, but there will be consideration of how this may be used in future. Moving on, the report called for a number of changes as to how made affirmative instruments are brought forward. In particular, the committee wanted to test whether regulations do in fact require to be made urgently. Uh, Deputy First Minister um, stated in paragraph 108 uh, um, that it was a vital tool um, having this power in handling the pandemic and um, that the Deputy First Minister and the Scottish Government agree that for the safeguarding of public health um, that the Scottish Government needed this but has no intent to use the made affirmative power as a matter of course going forward. Graham Simpson uh, said that the use of made affirmative power um, was only 20 times during 2012-2019 but up to 146 times during the one year period 2020 to 2021 and that made it a bad habit that the Scottish Government had fallen into and should only be used in exceptional circumstances and more um, or use of it should be debated and scrutinised in the Chamber. John Mason uh, said that vaccine passports was given more time for discussion. However, nightclubs and others were asking for urgency and it was reflective on the Parliament that they should have to actually try and address both elements there. Uh, Paul Sweeney said that a new type of framework should be built in order to avoid powers being retained by government, though the Scottish Parliament is well set up to achieve this, and it is something that we should um, be using uh, strongly going forward, the powers that we do actually already have here. Uh, comments were also made on how the Parliament looks at proposals for made affirmative powers in new bills. And now, as has already been noted, this is very relevant given the proposals in the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Bill. And Murdo Fraser um, said um, over such how, how such made affirmative powers, as in vaccine passports, should have taken more time for scrutiny um, by the Parliament as a whole, and the use of the power 
has been too frequent. Martin Whitefield, big pun. Martin Whitefield um, said that over fast legislation is very undesirable and hybrid procedures should be considered for further use in holding government to account. He welcomed the report and uh, said that the Scottish Government stating that it wants to avoid the necessity of the use of made affirmative powers is something um, which will be looked at by the SPPA, I believe, um, committee. Uh, this was strongly supported by Neil Bibby um, in his contribution also. So to conclude, presiding officer, if I've not rambled on too long, I want to end this debate where it began by re-emphasising what our convener, um, the, the DPLR co uh, committee, Stuart McMillan, said about why all this actually matters. Well, it matters because we have an interest in the balance of power between the parliament and the government. That's not just important for today, it will be important tomorrow, and it will be important for years to come. In that vein, the committee recognises that this report is only the first step in this work. It hopes that its recommendations will help guide the Parliament's scrutiny of future primary and secondary legislation in these coming months and years, and working with the Scottish Government to ensure that that is delivered. So thank you, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Kidd, uh, and that concludes the debate uh, on inquiry into the use of the made affirmative procedure during the coronavirus pandemic. And it is now time to move on to the next item of business. And I will allow a very short pause to uh, facilitate a change of front bench teams. Thank you.